Never in action. So, game theory has always bothered me. Want to make sure I'm not writing off the screen for Jesse. Okay. So, uh, game theory, the name has always bothered me uh, because I always think about Monopoly or Scrabble or something kind of a little fun that kids play. And when in fact, this is pretty sophisticated stuff. Uh, and it's something that's pretty serious and has pretty serious predictions to it. And, but, but yet at the same time, it's still kind of fun. So, uh, but in general, I like to think of it in a more sophisticated way as the theory of strategic behavior. The theory of strategic behavior. And what's powerful about it is that we're going to be looking at people's behavior and how they think and decide based on what other people will do. Now that's different than what we saw in perfect competition. So in perfect competition we said the firm was a price taker, right? So it took the price that was given to them. In other words, it didn't have any power in, in choosing the price. So here, uh, and, and then um, the uh, the outcome of profits was then somewhat determined by what, ha what other people did and it was just given to you and you reacted accordingly. But now your outcome, an agent's outcome, let's just say like profit, will be determined in part by what your competitor does. In perfect competition, you kind of decided, I'm going to produce this quantity of cost. But now, your outcome is going to be determined in part by what your competitor does. All right, so the setup to this is kind of interesting in that it's very simple. I never attempted this, but I think I could potentially go into a sixth grade classroom. Oh, by the way, who's were these? Mine. That was yours. All of them? Yeah. Okay. They were on, uh, last week they were on the desk, so I thought that was one of you. The setup for game theory um, can be very simple, uh, something you can probably teach a sixth grader to do, but the logic of it is very powerful. So I want to start off with an example. Suppose two firms Coke and Pepsi. Are determining whether to go with a high or low advertising budget.
So do we go with Taylor Swift or do we go with Britney Spears? You know, which which one? Although Britney's making kind of a comeback now, maybe she her price is rising, right? So a high budget or low budget? Do we break the bank and go with Taylor Swift or do we do we take uh, the oldie but goodie um, and hope that things work out for the best? So. Um, we're going to model that in a framework that looks a little different than what we've done in the past. And it looks like I will have to make up that framework, which I've done before. See if I can uh, not screw this up. So I want you to create kind of a matrix here where we're going to put Coke on the left hand side and Pepsi up above. And each agent is going to have a choice of picking a high budget or a low budget. If Pepsi chooses a high budget and Coke chooses a high budget, then each one of them make $20 million. <clears throat> now, if they both go with the budget budget <laughs> and go low, they both make $50 million because they're not spending as much money on advertising. Now where it gets interesting is that if Coke goes high with Taylor and Pepsi goes low with Britney, then Coke gets a hundred million dollars and Pepsi gets zero. And if vice versa happens, Pepsi goes high, Coke goes low, then Coke gets zero and Pepsi gets 100. So this takes a little bit of eyeball training. This whole thing is called the payoff matrix. The payoff matrix. The agents listed here on each side, those are our agents or players, Coke and Pepsi, the people making the decision. These options of high or low are the strategies or the choices. So strategy or the choice. Technically, it's called a strategy, but it's kind of weird when it's just one, like, what's your strategy? I'm going high, right? And so it's just one choice. but. Um, in more complicated games, we might go through a number of steps where it's a seven-step process. We won't really go through that in class, but a multi-step process where you're thinking a strategy. Okay, I'm going to do this if they do this, but I'm going to do this if they do this, you know, that type of thing. So it's called a strategy. And then lastly, within each cell of the payoff matrix, the first entry is always the agent that's listed over to the left. The second entry is the payoff to the agent up top. So left and right, it kind of reads itself that way. So this is uh, Coke's payoff. And this is Pepsi's payoff. And that's true whatever cell you're in. The first payoff listed is the agent to the left. 
The second payoff is the agent to the right. Or the second payoff is the agent listed up top. So economists are in the prediction business. What do you predict will be the outcome of this game? Fifty-fifty. Okay, why do you say that? Okay. So they're both gonna try and go low since fifties. you guys saying? Dustin? I mean, you could argue both that they would both go high and both end up with 2020 because if they're like, well, if we go high and Pepsi doesn't do anything, then we got that 100 million. Okay. But Pepsi's probably sitting there thinking the same thing. Well, if we get, if we go high and Coke doesn't gamble and doesn't do it, then I think they both end up with 2020. So you're thinking 2020 more so than 50-50. Working backwards, you're now let me let me just flip that though, Skylar and everybody. Is this outcome preferred to this outcome for yeah, both yeah. companies? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Wow. If, if they both have that same information and they both know that's then why wouldn't I guess it would be fifty fifty. Okay. Any other comments? All right, so you were, you were kind of touching on some strategies or possibilities of, of what to do and where to go. You didn't really succinctly say why 2020 would be. Imagine now yourself to be a self-interested, profit-maximizing company, right? So it's Coke versus Pepsi. Both of you can see the board here. So both of you can see the information here. You'll both be making a choice without knowing what the other's choice is. That's the other catch, which is another variation that we'll get into later, but we're gonna call this a simultaneous one-shot game. So assume these assumptions end up being important that this is a simultaneous game. What does that mean? It means that each person, each agent, each company will make their choice without knowledge of the other's choice. That's just a subtle distinction there, by the way. The chronology, oh crud, I don't want to lose my battery. Run, run. I brought that stinking thing I was thinking about. Last time this happened, it went so quick. Yes. Don't die on me anymore. Saved it. Okay. And that one's plugged in. All my gizmos plugged in. There they are. Okay. Um, if Coke makes its choice on Monday and Pepsi makes it Tuesday, it's the same thing as playing a simultaneous game, right? Where you're both making the decision at the same time. The time element doesn't matter, doesn't matter right? So that's the important part. That you're making your decision without knowing what the others chose. That's a simultaneous game. Um, then Coke, I'm just looking at Coke right now. Coke should always go high. Why? Because the worst that could happen is it just gets plenty, but it could get 100. Okay. And then low, it's possible Coke could get zero. Or okay. maybe 50, depending on whatever. That's just, so it always gets a payoff if it's this high. 
Okay, it always gets payoff if it goes high. Now you're dangling even closer to the direction I want to head with the thought process. You're like you're like this close to Ryan. She wouldn't be able to dominate if you go high, regardless. You're still going to get the payout if the other company shoots. Okay. You're dancing around the fringe too. What you guys are saying isn't wrong, but I just want to really clarify what your decision process is like. And so here's the way to think about it, or a different way to think about it. Instead of playing those games, well, oh, what if you do this, what if you do this? We'll really play that game. If Pepsi would choose low, what's your best answer, you being Coke? Go high. Go high because 100 is greater than 50, right? If, on the other hand, Pepsi goes high, what is your best response? Uh, high. high. So you should go high regardless of what Pepsi chooses. You have what's called a dominant strategy, a strategy that leaves you better off regardless of what the other agent chooses. So that's kind of a helpful way to start solving games is to go through that scenario. If, now work with me the other direction, which your eyeballs are gonna need a little training here. So now wear your Pepsi cap. Take off your Coke cap, put on your Pepsi cap. If Coke goes high, what should Pepsi do? Go high because 20 second entry is greater than zero. If Coke goes low, what should Pepsi do? High, because 100 is greater than 50. So Pepsi also has a dominant strategy of choosing high. Therefore, we would predict our most likely outcome is high and high, 20 and 20. What's that? So we just call each other up and both just go low. Okay, well that's bringing up another scenario that I'll get to. All right, so now that we figured that, that let's let's add let me add one more wrinkle to it. Um, does it change your answer if we play this a hundred yeah. times? A uh, hundred times. You would see how rational. So we're going to play once, then we're going to play twice, then we're going to play three times, then we're going to play four times, we're going to play a hundred times. Would you play a little differently knowing we're going to play a hundred times? Something like that. Pretty good. I think you understand the competition, how they play. Okay. So, Justin, what do you mean you take your shot? One hundred of the n equals one to a hundred times. When would you take your shot? Like around 50, 50, 50. In the middle, yeah. okay. At the beginning. At the beginning. Why at the beginning? Because there's a longer payout that you two both can enjoy. Okay. If you guys play the same game at the, in the beginning. That makes sense, right? So try it early. If you get screwed, then you can flip back to the to this position and still make 20, right? You got screwed once, but it was 0, 100. Hey, you burned me, screw that. I guess we're both going high for the rest of our lives, right? We're both hiring Taylor Swift at different times uh, for the rest of our lives. Maybe one does Taylor, one does Justin Bieber, and we switch swap sometimes, so. All right, so we might try it early, and then if we get burned, change it. Okay, so let's say that we were all now remember, we're competitors with each other. We're not best buddies, right? Um, if the cooperative type solution goes out to 100, what's your incentive on the 100th time if you're Coke and you've been playing kind of nicey-nicey for a long time? What's your incentive on the 100th time?
So you've, you've established a long, nice track record of going 50-50. What might be your incentive on the hundredth time? Go high. Go high. All right, because on the last time, I'm going to zap. I'm going to zap them, right? So that way I've gotten 50 the whole time, and then on the hundredth try, I zap them. So, so we only get to the hundredth of it, and that's the hundredth of the Yeah, the hundredth okay. is it. I wasn't playing it indefinitely. A hundred. I was thinking a hundred. Now, that would be Coke's thinking, but then Pepsi's thinking to itself, wait a second. I know Coke. They're pretty clever. They're probably thinking they're going to flip on the hundredth. So what would be the optimal strategy to do on Coke to burn their butt? 99. 99. So now Pepsi's like, I don't know all them better. I'm going to get them on the 99th. And then Coke says, wait a second. I know that he thinks what I'm thinking, and I'm going to get him on the 98th. And then Pepsi starts thinking, wait a second. If he thinks I'm doing the 100th and the 199th, uh, I'm going to get him on the 96th. 95th, 94th, 93rd, 92. And the whole thing unravels down to? Uh, not necessarily zero sum in this case, but it, um, we'll come back to zero sum later. But in this case, it would uh, unravel back to this being an optimal strategy. If you play that logic all the way through, you come back to playing this strategy all 100 times. Now, if we go to infinity, in other words, we don't define a hundred, we just say we're going to play this indefinitely. Neither one of us knows when it's going to end. Now that takes a different complexion to it too, right? Because now you've only played a hundred. Well, if we live for forever, that's a relatively small fraction of the time. Kind of back to the logic of I'm going to try in the front end of the game to see if they'll play ball with me, but then I'll damn them forever if they screw me over. But now you're not going to play a hundred times, so you can't unravel it back. You're going to play indefinitely. So already on this little simple game, we've kind of created uh, situations where it can start to get more and more complex. Okay, so under a simultaneous game, each agent will make the choice without knowledge of the others. So there can be also a sequential game so well wait a second maybe i want to we were assuming for this game let me come back to this i'll, I'll list them separately number two if it was a one shot game we're going to play it one time and we're done and then maybe we'll kind of note here that we could have a repeated game a finite game that is repeated, sometimes just referred to as a repeated game. So play 100 times. Or we could have an infinite game where we just play indefinitely. We don't know when the in ending point's going to be. And maybe I will, I'm kind of coming back to wanting to keep these, let's put parentheses, could be sequential. In other words, you take turns. I go, then you go, then I go, then you go. We didn't even talk about that here. So if this game is sequential, where Coke goes first, what would Coke choose? So Coke gets to go first, Pepsi will see what they chose, and then 
to something else? Does that change our equilibrium here? So uh, this will be a one-shot sequential game. So we're going to play it one time, but now Coke gets to go first. Does that give Coke an advantage here? What would Coke choose if they have to go first? They're going to go high. Why? Because, uh, yes, that's true. They have a dominant strategy. To this solution anyway right so in this case uh, making it a sequential game doesn't matter that can change the complexion of the game um, later when we look at different payouts all right so go ahead Jesse the first entry is Coke's payoff. So it would be zero down here if that's where you're looking. The second entry is Pepsi's payoff. Okay. So it's always the second payoff is Pepsi, the first payoff is Coke. And so if they chose low, since Pepsi can see these answers too, then Pepsi, <clears throat> which one would Pepsi choose if Coke goes low? high right because they would be getting a hundred which is bigger than 50. so coke has the luxury of knowing what pepsi's going to do um, after they move and they can kind of figure out which now when we have a different set of payoffs that could prove to be or that will prove to be advantageous to have what we call a first mover advantage but it'll be under a different set of circumstances No. Um, so once they choose, the other player chooses, and then you're done. Yeah. Otherwise, if there's some sort of take back thing, then that would be kind of similar to a simultaneous game. Yeah. Yeah. And under, under the assumptions of the model, that would be it. OK, so we've got a number of different scenarios here. Simultaneous or sequential, how are the players going to move? How many times is it being played? All right, our last consideration is something that you brought up earlier, I think Justin did. Well, what if they just call each other up on the phone and agree to something? That's possible. It's called a cooperative solution. And maybe they could agree to 50 and 50. Now, there's one problem with that in the United States. What is it if we're really dealing with Coke and Pepsi? What's that? Collusion. Collusion is illegal, yes. You will be thrown in jail or administered some fines or something. So it's illegal. So the antitrust laws keep companies from colluding with each other. Why? Because we want competition. Why? Because competition helps drive prices down for consumers right so it gives us a better solution from society's point of view if we keep competition healthy so under those set of circumstances um, the collusive arrangements not possible but we need to put it down so this is a non-cooperative in other words the agents are not allowed to cooperate with each other so agents cannot collude. It could be cooperative. Well, then, yeah, then you get into just people finding out down the road or through the grapevine, and then 
We get people like my brother-in-law that uh, are forensic digital people that can go uncover emails to see if there was hidden communications. As you've learned within the last two months, the government is collecting everybody's communications potentially. And so they can just digital up their archives and say, oh, well, this cell phone was registered to Coke. Let's do a little Google search to see who said, let's cooperate, cooperate on getting Britney. We both go the Britney strategy and they Google Britney and up comes an email batch that, you know, so that's how. So through information getting out. So it's becoming really harder and harder for companies to be able to pull that off. And, but even when we didn't have the technology we do today, it was difficult for companies to pull it off. One of the reasons it's difficult for companies to pull it off is that even if they both agree on paper, what's the incentive system here? Maximize shareholders' wealth. What's that? Maximize shareholders' wealth, right. So if both of them have incentive to cheat on the agreement. So oftentimes what will happen is that they may not be busted by the government, but they cheat on their own agreement anyway. And so then once both parties cheat, we get right back to the non-cooperative solution anyway. So they ended up not cooperating in the end or if those agreements tend to fall apart. Um, that's part of the reason why we've seen one of the world's most famous cartels. Anybody know what the world's most famous cartel is probably? Sure. OPEC, yeah. Anybody know what OPEC stands for? O P E C. Exporting parts. Yeah, the exporting parts in there, right? That's not oil, though. That's always the thing that throws people. Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. So you pulled off the exporting good apart there. So um, if you go back and analyze gas prices, they're actually not much higher than what normal inflation would have been anyway over time. And so the fact that they control the world supply of oil would lead them to have bigger profits than what, um, than what we tend to observe. And part of the reason is, is that each one of those individual countries tends to cheat on their agreement, holding back a little bit of production. And that's just one of many agreements, the mob and other organized crime and that uh, that kind of fall apart is what uh, economic theory would predict would happen because incentives don't line up. All right. So a couple more things to put down here is how we solved it. So we talked about a dominant strategy. And the equilibrium that we predicted is called a Nash equilibrium. Did anybody see the movie A Beautiful Mind? Yeah. Anybody remember the main char character that saw it? Skylar, do you remember who the main character was in that? Yeah. Who was it? <laughs> Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe, that's right. Bye. And the Super Bowl. Who did Russell Crowe play? Something Nash. Something Nash, good. John Nash. John Nash. All right, so uh, we've got a couple things going on here that we need to outline that are important uh, for the study. So first of all, let me just start, start off with the dominant strategy. This is probably the first step as you guys go through some homework problems is to look for a dominant strategy because it kind of makes solving the game a little bit easier if it's kind of a no-brainer for somebody. So a dominant strategy is a strategy, or in many cases, you can just think of it as being the choice, a strategy that leaves an agent better off regardless of the other agents choice or strategy. A strategy that leaves an agent better off regardless of the 
other agent's strategy. So to kind of use a little bit of shorthand on what we did here, it's easy to test each agent's position on whether they have a dominant strategy or not. So I'm gonna just work a little bit of shorthand. Um, if, if Coke chooses high, then Pepsi should choose high. If Coke chooses low, then Pepsi should choose high. Therefore, Pepsi has a dominant strategy of high. Right? They should choose high no matter what. And the same holds true. I won't go through that one, but it, you can use the same kind of work through the same logic there. If Pepsi goes high, Coke should choose high. If Pepsi chooses low, Coke should choose high. Coke should choose high no matter what. Therefore, Coke has a dominant strategy of high. So this is just a shorthand way to kind of work through that dominant strategy logic. Now, a separate concept, the idea of a national strategy company. So, a strategy combination. such that neither player, neither agent, player, neither agent wishes to change choice, taking as given, taking as given the other's choice. A strategy combination such that neither agent wants to change their choice, taking as given the other's choice. So you can always look for a Nash equilibrium by going to any one of the potential solutions and just saying, would this guy want to change their answer? Would this guy want to change their answer? So let's go to 100, 0. Would Coke want to change their answer if we were here? No, because 100 is greater than 50. Would Pepsi like to change their answer? Yes, so it's not a Nash equilibrium. So let's try this one. Would Coke want to change their answer? No, because 20 is greater than 0. Would Pepsi want to change their answer? I know this takes a little eyeball training. No, because 20 is greater than 0. Yes, it's the second entry. It takes a little bit to work through that. You're going to get some exercises to try, uh, and you'll get there. You'll get there. Um, so this, neither player wants to change their answer, so that is a Nash equilibrium. And so it's kind of custom to put a little N up in the upper right-hand corner of that solution. So same thing with 50. You know, you could say, would Coke like to change their answer if we're down here? Would Coke like to change their answer? Yes, 100 is greater than 50. So that's not an Nash equilibrium. As soon as somebody wants to change, then you can forget about it and move on. So that's how we define a Nash equilibrium. So the idea of equilibrium, the, the general concept that I like to use is a situation where there's no tendency for change, right? We're kind of in this chill spot where until we get disrupted, there's no tendency for change. 
Uh, and so that's what Nash said too. If neither player has incentive to change, then things will probably not change, right? So that was his idea of an equilibrium. Okay, questions or comments there? What's the word right there? Take as given. Taking as given. All right. Um, this particular setup has a special name, and it's called the Prisoner's Dilemma. Um, the story with these payoffs can be told a different way so that we're spending years in jail. So imagine uh, the, the original paper uh, that was written on this was, suppose Bonnie and Clyde are arrested and they uh, had committed some crime, but the evidence is kind of shaky. So hopefully none of you have been arrested too many times, but in the movies or on TV, when they get criminals, what do the police tend to do? They bargain with them, that's right. What do they do immediately though? Like if they catch two people that were apprehended, they separate them, right? They separate them. So that's the first step is to separate the two criminals. And now we start the bargaining, right? And so the idea is we go to Bonnie and we say, listen, Bonnie, I think we got enough evidence to get you. But if she denies the crime and Clyde denies the crime and there's really not enough evidence, then they both get off scot-free. So this would be confess and deny. And they would get the best situation if they both don't rat each other out. But they don't necessarily know how much evidence the state has on whether they convict or not. They don't know they're both criminals, so they don't know how trustworthy maybe the other person is. And so the deal that is cut by the police is to say, listen, I know you guys did it, but if you confess and Clyde doesn't, then I'm going to give you uh, absolutely no time in jail, right? And I'm going to throw the book at the other guy. Now, if you both end up confessing, you're just going to get some probation. No big deal, right? So we kind of lay the consequences out of scot-free, maybe probation, maybe five years in the slammer doing heavy time. And so um, we give incentive for each person to confess. The unfortunate thing with that setup, the reason why we call it the prisoner's dilemma is kind of twofold. One, the dilemma is you're not sure if the other person's gonna rat you out and put you in a bad spot. The other thing is that it gives you incentive to confess to all of the details. And that person ended up confessing. So he later confessed that he just made it up to try to cover his own butt. I got a three year sentence, but he was faced with the possibility of a 10 year sentence. And so the attorney suggested that he confess because the payoffs were better for confessing as opposed to denying on the risk that they take. So happens in real life, the odds are usually stacked such that there's incentive to confess, possibly even to a crime you didn't commit. All right, so that's the prisoner's dilemma. <clears throat> You'll see it in a few different forms. This little simple four by four matrix, um, anybody remember what that, or I guess I already said it, didn't I? The, the movie was called with John Nash, what was it called? Beautiful a Beautiful Mind. Here's the beautiful part to it is that John Nash came up with this whole concept here of strategic behavior on this little simple four by four matrix. And we've already seen how complex it can be by thinking about cooperative or non-cooperative, repeated or not repeated, blah, blah, blah. But even just these payoffs alone, there are 72 permutations of getting different answers on how you organize this chart. So if I change this, and don't do this to your papers, but if I change this to a 60, right? 
So with that change, is this a Nash equilibrium anymore? No, it's changed. See what I mean? So that's a, now we have two permutations that you've seen of how the payoffs can be organized. And it turns out there's 72 different representations of how you, of modifications you could make. Uh, strategic behavior. Okay, questions or comments there? We're going to watch a short video on some game theory. history here on how this came about. I think it's about eight or nine minutes. Uh, let's see, I gotta do volume now. Don't I? Just start the volume. Oh, hold on. Let's see, I gotta figure out how to do this. Um, how did I do this before? You gotta mute everything else so the sound's always coming out of one thing. Because otherwise you're getting feedback from it. So it's the speaker yeah. from here that was causing the feedback, right? Because then the microphone, yeah, that's right, that's right. So I gotta turn off the speaker for Jesse. So Jesse, kind of nod if you if this thing ends up coming around. I think this should work. Because the microphone's still on, not if you can hear me, right? <laughs> Jesse, can you hear me? Yeah, she can. did this one other time though and it worked didn't we I feel like we're just messing up one thing but then oh and then share the screen with her yeah that would work all right let me try one more Jesse we were getting echo. I don't know if you were, but we were getting echo. So hold on. Let me try to see what happens here. I'm going to share my screen with the other one. Mute my audio. Okay. Which means i got to share through this thing. Somehow. Now. Share screen. Okay. Oops. And then this. You know, I'm not sure if this is going to work either. This is a failed, distorted idea. The proof that you might be wrong about to emerge from the most unlikely. We will benefit our development moves if we are guided solely by the striving for gain. For this purpose, we have to return to an automatic system which produces a power, self directed okay, on, on, system. I want to check on Jesse.
this thing by the new here on it. Jesse, could you hear that? Okay. I'm going to email you the link, and then we're going to take a break after this. So there might be a slight delay, but I'm going to email while I play it for these guys. I thought I was looking at the there. there. Sometimes this just blows my mind. Like, I think things are going one way. So what's going on? I'm sharing the screen here. They were strategic moves to convince the Soviets that if they attacked, America would always have enough missiles to destroy them in return. And in the rules of this game, fear and self-interest stopped the Russians from attacking. They created a stable equilibrium between the 
their strategies to each other. In a series of equations in which he was written in their real time, Ash showed that a system driven by suspicion and selfishness did not have to lead to chaos. He proved that there could always be a point of equilibrium in which everyone's self-interest was perfectly balanced against each other. something that's very non-profit, very selfish. And then what all of them do works together and there's, there's deriving from that there's a payoff to our own players. That is the equilibrium. But it's understood not to be a cooperative idea. But the stability the equilibrium only happen if everyone involved behaves selfishly. Because if they cooperate, the result is unpredictable and dangerous. A famous game was developed in Africa to show that in any interaction, selfishness always led to a safer action. It was called the prisoner's dilemma. There are many versions, but all of them involve two players having to decide whether to trust or to betray. No way of predicting how 
the common person will behave. That is the dilemma. But what Nash's equation showed was that the rational choice was always to betray the other person. Because that way, at the worst, you've got to keep the dial. And at the best, Okay, that's it. Let's take a little break. That was part one. Jesse, did, oh. <laughs> did you get the email? Yes. Okay. I was having trouble getting into my Gmail. I just got it. Oh, you did? Okay. okay. We're just We're taking just a quick break, break, so it's so about it's a seven-minute seven video. video. You can you watch can it watch right it now if you want. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry about Sorry the about mix up. That's okay. Oh, you can just see my screen right now. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I don't have anything too secretive on my email. But okay. So I just wanted you to know. There we go. Now you can probably see me. sounded like you had this figured out. So what, what did you think I needed to do? Did you share the screen? Is there a drill? Is there a uh, enable audio? So if I shared, if I ran the video through my computer and shared the screen? Well, you had it all hooked up to you. So you were to see everything except for that. And then you were to, that way we could do it. And then you were to send it to them. Is there a little button? Because I think in another class you watched the video time and we had to try to enable audio. And that allows the other people besides your son to use your screen to listen to whatever your screen is looking at. By enabling the audio on it. Yeah, so try sharing the screen. There should be a little deal there to enable audio. Okay. Well, I don't want to, I don't know if I'll screw up. Well, Guess he's working on uh, something here. Okay. Okay. You want to take the kid here. Let's try and share this screen. 